And that now brings us to the third, which I hate, hate, hate when we have to do this, but sometimes we have to. Hey, Jeff Marsacci, the Plain English Attorney, and as you can see, we are back in Raleigh at the Mordecai Beverage Company. Uh, gonna be meeting up with the Civitan Governor for the Eastern District of North Carolina in a little bit. Just hang out with her, her husband, Kathy and I have some drinks with them. Uh, so I thought, hey, time to make the video. Uh, this week, I'm gonna talk about three types of special needs trusts that we use in our practice. Now let me start by saying the one that we don't use, if at all possible, it just doesn't make any sense to do a testamentary trust for a special needs beneficiary, not with the other options that we have. Now the testamentary trust is, all right, we're gonna set up a will and it's gonna say, hey, this money's held in trust for the special needs beneficiary, which also means it's going to be overseen and administered by the court for the lifetime of that beneficiary. What, you, what usually ends up happening is the expenses and the time, it just, it weighs on the trustee and it becomes this, uh, this nightmare of paperwork and accounting and justification for every little thing that they do that's just not there when you use the other types of trusts. So that's the one we're not gonna talk about. All right, so what are the other three? All right, well, the first trust, it's actually your basic revocable living trust. The fact is, when you hear, oh, you need a special needs trust, a lot of times it's just having the right provisions in the revocable living trust as the main part of your estate plan. There doesn't need to be some actual separate document all the provisions that you really need are right in a good revocable living trust, which means, all right, there's a trustee in charge of the money. It's in the discretion of the trustee. The beneficiary is the beneficiary, but they don't have the right to demand anything. The second they have the right to demand something, or it says that this money has to come out, it could make them vulnerable to having benefits lost unless that money is spent. But all of that can kind of be set up in a revocable living trust as the main part of someone's estate plan. Okay, so as you can see, I'm here with Kathy. Say hi, Kathy. All right, so the second type of trust that we use, which really isn't used as frequently as just having the revocable trust handle it, it's when we do a separate special needs trust well, all right, what are the circumstances where we would need a separate special needs trust? There are a couple, and I detail a lot more of this uh, in my book, The Simple Guide to Special Needs Estate Planning, uh, and we'll put the link in the description below. But essentially, it's, all right, if there's someone other than the person doing the planning, which is usually the parents, maybe the grandparents want to leave money for that special needs beneficiary, but they don't wanna do it through the parents. Okay, we can set up that separate special needs trust so their inheritance goes directly in. And now any other relative that wants to leave some separate money to help out that special needs beneficiary, they can just put it into the trust, either by gifting or by an inheritance through their own will or trust so it goes to that trust and now that's set up for their benefit. Again, with the same principles that I mentioned with the revocable trust, there's a separate trustee in charge of it. They have discretion uh, to use the funds for the benefit of the beneficiary. There's nothing that allows the beneficiary to demand money come out. There's nothing that's set to automatically go out. That's gonna help preserve their benefits. Second instance, if for some reason there's going to be enough money in an estate that it would be estate taxable, we can set it up with a separate trustee, not the parents, but a separate trustee 
they can gift money into the trust and now the trust can actually buy a life insurance policy that will pay out into the trust and all that life insurance money is not going to be subject to estate taxes if it's done right for the professionals out there who understand this stuff it's kind of using that special needs trust like an irrevocable life insurance trust an islet so those are the two big situations and there may be some others but mainly that's it now that means for a lot of the couples we're doing planning for and the individuals we're doing planning for that have a special needs beneficiary oh no the grandparents aren't leaving them anything directly there aren't any other relatives oh we don't have an estate that's going to hit over the now 11.7 million we don't have to worry about that that's the point if someone's saying oh you need a special needs trust no you need the right provisions in a revocable living trust and that now brings us to the third, which I hate, hate, hate when we have to do this, but sometimes we have to. Okay, so now this next trust, the one that I, the part that I really hate about this, these are called D4A trusts and they get their praises sung. Oh, they're so great, they're so wonderful it's an item of last resort if you haven't planned ahead then these might be an absolute necessity but far better it's planning ahead of time using one of the other two trusts or maybe both to secure the money and not have it end up being lost all right so what what do we exactly mean by that the way i look at these trusts it's it's kind of like saying that Narcan is the best thing ever for drug addiction treatment. No, it's not. It's not. It will help save someone's life if they have an overdose of heroin, which is great. But that's not the point you want to get to. That's not what we're talking about if you want to actually solve a problem of drug addiction. There are plenty of other treatment things. Yeah, Narcan does some great things to save a life if there's an overdose, but the far better result is let's not have someone to get to the point where there is an overdose. All right, so these D4A trusts, they can be set up if that special needs beneficiary has money. Okay, so that's already a planning fail if the parents left something directly to the child or they didn't do any planning and they're just a beneficiary because under law they inherited it through intestacy. All right, we can set up a D4A trust. What are the failure points of a D4A trust? Typically the court's gonna have to supervise all the expenses so it's kind of like it being in probate for the rest of the life of the beneficiary or at least until the money runs out. Okay, what else? It's used to take care of their needs, which if they qualify for benefits like health needs and education and occupational therapy, you know, whatever, there's a good chance that it would be covered under a program anyway. So the money just sits there. And then what happens when the special needs beneficiary finally passes on? It goes to the government. What kind of end result is that? Is that the preferred end result? Or would you rather have the money in the discretion of a trustee that you've picked, who's gonna use it for the benefit of the beneficiary to pay for the extras that the programs don't pay for to give them a better quality of life? So when I hear people praising the D4A trust, it's, yeah, it's like praising Narcan which does have a place, but it's not to be praised for solving a drug addiction problem because it doesn't. It's the last resort. Okay, so what are some of these extras that the revocable trust or the separate special needs trust can take care and pay for for a special needs beneficiary that might be beneficial but isn't coming under that health, education, maintenance, and support outline? Well, I knew someone who owned a swim academy and they had a very specific program that helped special needs children and young adults 
with autism or Down syndrome gain a lot of confidence through learning to swim. That was a phenomenal thing. They saw results across all other areas because of that confidence that they gained. But that's not something that would have been considered health or education under usual guidelines. The trust could pay for that stuff. So she had several clients where parents or grand, more likely grandparents had money coming in from those trusts to pay for those swim lessons. That was a perfect thing. Uh, there's also a ton of other like separate trips. I know someone, um, one of my clients, they have a son that's in a group home and they will actually go to concerts or take trips to restaurants and things like that. It, it, but it, they need supervision. This can help pay for that stuff. That's not stuff that Medicaid will pay for. So it's things like that that'll really help improve quality of life, but aren't considered basic necessities that these trusts can handle for them. All right, so I am here with Helga Fasciano. She is the governor for the North Carolina District East Civitan. So Helga, just tell us a little bit about what Civitans does with special needs adults and children. Perfect. So first of all, Civitan International is an organization made up of clubs that do community service. And one of the focus is working with members of the community that are identified IDD individuals. So with that, there are several ways that Civitan support those members of our community. One is through research with the Civitan International Research Center, the only one of its kind supported by Civitan International. The other is doing special projects, um, fundraising to help members that are associated with other uh, nonprofit organizations, such as Special Olympics. And then finally, working with those community members to help them form their own club so that they get a sense of community and give them an opportunity to give back as well. And those are a labor of love because we support them both with administration and oftentimes with funding to help with their membership needs. And it's a great opportunity. It's wonderful to see that community come together. And that was actually one of my points that I'm making that if you're putting together a specific type of special needs trust that's not just to take care of basic needs, this can actually help pay for their dues, pay for some of the extra things that might be needed to participate, tickets to ball games, things like that. You can do that with the right kind of special needs trusts, not the ones that seem to be plugged out there that are only really for primary needs, which the benefit programs are supposed to be taking care of anyway. So thank you very much, Helga, for telling us about Civitans. Uh, you might want to check them out too. Yeah, come join us. Thank you. Okay, so that's the three main trusts that we work with and see on a, at least a weekly basis at my law office. So I hope you found that information useful. As always, please go ahead and subscribe and put in the comments what, you know, any questions that you might have and just mention that you subscribed. We'd love to get back to you and hear what you want to see more of. And as always, stay safe, plan ahead and enjoy life. And whatever you do, make it a great day.